thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, we worship you. We worship you. For your name is excellent in all the earth. We honor you, Lord. We're overcomers, Father. We are overcomers in you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for your faith you've given us. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You restored unto us the joy of our salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You've made us to sit together with you in heavenly places in Christ. Oh, hallelujah, Father. Oh, we magnify you, we magnify you. Thank you, Lord, we bless you. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Father, for the overcoming ability that you've put on the inside of us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for seating us with you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Father, we are more than conquerors because of you who loved us. And our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. We declare, Lord, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It's not by our might, it's not by our power, Lord, but by your spirit that is working in us. We exalt you, Lord, the power that comes from you, that makes us rise up, Father, rise up from situations. Even as you spoke, rise up to people who hadn't risen in years, Father. We rise up out of any despondency, out of any despair, and we speak joy in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord and praising and worshipping Him. We're also glad for all of you who are watching us online and praising and worshipping along with us. And let's believe that God is doing mighty things even as we are blessing Him and giving Him all the praise and glory. And let's remind ourselves that the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. And when He inhabits our praises, we know that there is healing that there is joy and there is all the good things that we can expect as we are praising Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the joy that you've restored to us. We thank you that you're turning our mourning, Father, into dancing. And we thank you that our sorrow is turned into joy, Father. Thank you, Father, for making us rise up and mount up on wings like eagles. And Lord, we're going to run and not grow weary. We're going to walk and not faint. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's rejoice in the Lord and say, this is how we overcome. You know, the word says in Revelations 12, 11, that we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the lamb is the most powerful weapon that we have. And that is what is going to enable us to overcome any situation in life. So we're going to sing about the overcoming power that Jesus gives to us. Amen. Let's rejoice in him.
Redeemer lives. Amen. We serve a risen Lord and a King who is living and He's alive forevermore. And let's remind ourselves that He has rescued our soul. His blood has removed all our sins. And as far as the East is from the West, so far has He removed our transgressions. So we're going to remind ourselves and say, Lord, I thank you that you are alive and you are working. Amen. Let's rejoice in Him. My Redeemer lives. Let's put our hands together. Hallelujah. One. living inside of us father we thank you father that you said lord that we who are alive can praise you so lord we choose to praise you even the dead they don't praise the lord but we who have breath we can praise about our redeemer who lives thank you lord we speak it father we speak it you are alive father thank you for making us the temple of the living god thank you jesus the bible says in, in the book of we see in um, Corinthians where the Lord says, our bodies are the temple of the living God and we are his temple and that's where the Lord lives in. And when we know that the Lord lives inside of us, we will start using our bodies and our hands for his glory. 
So the more we begin to confess and say, Lord, I know that I'm your temple. I'm, my body is your temple. It's no longer about myself or what I want anymore, but I know that my body belongs to you. And that's what this song is all about. as a declaration saying that we are the temple of the living God. We are overcomers in Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's declare who we are in Christ. Greater is He. Greater 
Father, we are overcomers in Jesus' name. We are overcomers, Father. We overcome the sickness in this world. We overcome poverty. We overcome every sin in this world, Lord, because of your blood. So grateful to you, Lord, for your blood that you've shed for us. Thank you, Father. The blood will never lose its power. sing this song that reminds us that we are redeemed from the curse of sin so important to remind ourselves that we are no longer under the curse but we are under the blessing Galatians 2.20 Paul says I am crucified with Christ it's no longer I that lives but Christ is living in me and we see how Jesus he came and he took the curse upon himself so that we might receive the blessing and the curse we see is threefold, sin, sickness, and poverty. Everything that destroyed this world is under those three categories, sin, sickness, and poverty. And Jesus took every amount of that curse upon his body. And so that's why we can say, now I'm redeemed from that curse. We don't have to accept it that that's the normal. We can say in Jesus' name, I'm redeemed from that curse of sin. I'm redeemed. If it's a bad addiction, you can say, I'm redeemed from that in Jesus' name. If it's a sickness, you can say, Lord, I'm redeemed from that curse. That curse has no authority over my body. Or if it's some kind of a poverty and the enemy has tried to keep you in lack and want, you can say, no, in Jesus' name, I'm redeemed from that curse. And this song is a reminder to ourselves to declare those promises of redemption. And even as you're singing it, remind yourself and say, yes, Lord, I'm redeemed. Because the enemy will try to tell you it's, that's how it's going to be. That's how you're always going to be. That's how you're condition of your bodies but you say no in Jesus name I'm born again and I'm redeemed from that curse hallelujah thank you father the Lord is healing you right now wherever you might be if it's a long term illness you can say in Jesus name I believe that I can be redeemed from that curse like the woman with the issue of blood when she got faith into her she said I'm going to go and touch his garment and I'm going to be whole so believe right now in Jesus name that you can be whole from that situation from that sickness Jesus paid a high price to set you free from the curse. Amen. Amen. Let's sing about it. I'm redeemed from the curse. And we're overcoming the devil by the blood of the Lamb. of sin for your blood has set me free I'm redeemed from the curse of sickness for your blood has set me free I'm redeemed from the curse of poverty for your blood has set me free now I overcome the devil by the blood of the
redeemed from the curse of poverty for your blood has set me free now i overcome the devil by the some declarations before we listen to the word. Say with me, I am an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. I, overcome I overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb the of and the word of my testimony. Of my testimony. Greater, is Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I reject, I reject every, thought every thought of the enemy. Of the enemy. I, cast it down in Jesus name. I cast it down in Jesus' name. I choose to set my mind, set my mind on things that are above. Thank you, for perfect peace. Thank you for perfect peace. I speak healing over my body. Speak healing over my In, body. Jesus name, In Jesus' name, I'm redeemed from the curse, from the curse. By, the blood of Jesus. by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Look at someone and say, you're redeemed from the curse. You're redeemed Hallelujah. From the curse. Redeemed from the curse. Redeemed from the curse. Hallelujah. Truly, we are redeemed from the curse. Thank God. That's why we can rejoice and that's why we can say thank you, Father, for redeeming us from the curse of poverty, sickness, disease, fear. Whatever the devil has planned against you is all nullified by the word of God because Jesus said we are free. If Jesus said we are free, we are free indeed. Thank God for his grace of the lights and also volume yes. thank you father praise God thank you Lord for your goodness <clears throat> so we are redeemed from the curse likes uh, as we believe and we grow stronger and stronger by seeing what he has redeemed us from into what he has brought us into so as children of the Most High God, we can always walk in victory. There's no reason for us to live in defeat. There's no reason for us to uh, let circumstances dominate us. You know, people have a lot of sayings. You know, I, I sometimes think, oh, I, I, I wish I could just hold them in. But then I don't want to offend them sometimes. They get offended and then they, I might lose my friendship. Take care, they say. I feel like saying, oh, I've already cast all my care upon the Lord, so why would I want to take it back? Take care. 
Lots of people, they, you know, they meet with you and then when they, when they depart, they say, take care. What for? What am I going to take care for? Because I have to, I've cast all my care upon the Lord. The Bible says, cast all your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. He cares for you, so why would I want to take somebody's care or my own care and try to make me feel so miserable? I don't want to take any care. I want to say I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I've just cast all my care upon the Lord. How are you doing today? I'm under the circumstances. <clears throat> but the Bible says, and I'm, I'm talking about Christians. I can understand for non-Christian. But uh, Christians, they learn the language of the world. Fancy sayings. Well, I'm living under the circumstances. You're not supposed to be living under the circumstances. As the scripture said, you are over the circumstances. That scripture that we have put up there, 1 John 1, 5, 4, it says you overcome the world, all the circumstances that, that's created by the, by the God of this world by faith. So you overcome. You don't stay under the circumstances, nor are you going to take any care. Tickle me to death. Why wouldn't you say, tickle me to laugh or life? Tickle you to death. And all of a sudden, the person was smiling away, and the next moment you see that he's gone. Oh, I met him yesterday. He was laughing away. But this morning, he passed away. He got himself tickled to death. <laughs> we begin to wonder why. These are come from the pits of hell that have got into their tongue and they keep saying, oh, we are very joyful people, but then use your joy in the right manner. I mean, have some manners when you use the words rightly. There are Christian ethics, especially in the spiritual realm, where we use the right terms to, to declare our blessings over our lives. I mean, that's how we need to walk in the ways of the Lord, by overcoming. We kind of think, well, it's all right. I mean, that's, that's it. That's what the world understands. Maybe the world understands that, but we don't. We understand the language of the Spirit of God. And the language of the Spirit of God is the, is the Word of God, the promises of God, the blessings of God, the goodness of God, the mercies of God, and the power of God. We want to be, we want to go on with the, I mean, with the trend of the world. No, we don't have to. You don't belong to this world, the Bible says. Christ Jesus redeemed you out of the world into himself, into his kingdom. You don't belong to this world. Jesus said, I pray for you. I pray that God will not take you away from this world, but you shall, you shall stay in this world and, and you shall be protected that was the intercessory prayer that Jesus made in John 17 where he prayed and said, Father, I don't pray that you should take them away, but I pray that you keep them from the evil. And I believe that God the Father heard the prayer of Jesus and he is all willing to protect you. I pray, that scripture in John 17 and verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. We, world overcomers need, to, need not go out of the world. When Jesus prayed that prayer, he, he, spoke, he spoke about overcomers. I pray not that they should. I pray not that thou should should have taken us them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. Evil, because he's, he's praying for winners. He's praying for victorious people. He's not praying for those who are, who are losing ground. He's talking to winners. We are gaining ground, in fact. The kingdom of God is advancing. Every believer born into the family, every believer coming into in the knowledge of Christ, we advance the kingdom. The kingdom of God has been advanced. Every, I mean, I believe that many, many are getting born again. You don't read that in the newspapers. 
you got to understand in the spirit that God is working things. The devil wouldn't say 5,000 people got saved in this crusade. The devil wouldn't say so and so witnessed and she got healed and delivered and now she's born again. You won't hear that in the, in the, in the media. In the mainstream, mainstream media, you would not hear that. You would only hear them about the destruction, all what the stealing is taking place and all what the destructions are taking place and all what the devil is doing. So he puts a big picture, he puts a big face out there to show that everything bad is happening around and, and we, are, we are trying, you know, to make meet ends meet or we are trying to, to work this thing out. But Jesus said, I'm praying for winners that they should not go out of the world but they should stay in the world and God protect them. Protect them. And, and how many miserable Christians are praying, oh God, please take us away. Please close the shop and Lord, so that we will be all raptured and taken away and Lord, everything would be, uh, I mean, let the world go to hell. We don't care. God doesn't want the world to go to hell. God wants people to be saved and its own salvation can come only through you. You are the mediator now. Now when I say we are the mediator, we're not talking about the great mediator, but we are talking about the message of the mediator. We are the mediators of the mediator, the Christ, uh, mediator Christ Jesus who died for us. And we, are, we have been given the word of reconciliation. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile the world back to us. So why would we pray such prayers which are contrary to the prayer of Jesus? The prayer of Jesus is, Lord, that you protect them and keep them from evil. Keep them from evil. That's how God, God wants us to be. We have been protected from evil. We have been redeemed from the curse. Go with me to the book of Galatians and chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Thank God that we are we are. We are called by the Lord and brought us out of the world that we might be delivered from evil. Verse 3, verse 4. Galatians 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins. All, everything. That he might deliver us from the present evil world. So, if you and I are believers who believe that Jesus gave himself for our sins, for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world, then you are redeemed, you are delivered from the present evil world. You are, you are delivered. You are delivered from the present evil world. Anything that the evil that's happening in the world, you're delivered from it. That's a declaration of our faith. That's how we pronounce our faith. That's how we boldly declare that we are, de we are delivered from the present evil, anything evil, sickness, disease, poverty, shortcomings, any deficit, you're free from it. You are delivered from it. You, you are not going to be delivered after your death. You are delivered while you are living here on earth. So why would I want to live in fear? Why would I entertain fear in my life? I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of all the things that are happening around. I mean, lots of things that people are talking are fear. It's all fear-based. When God says... When Jesus prayed, he said, I pray that they would not be taken away from the world, but Lord, that you would, you would deliver them from the world, or you'll protect them, keep them from the world. And Jesus says, and here we find the Holy Spirit through Paul is writing and said, after his resurrection, who gave himself for our sins. If he gave himself for our sins, we are not sinners anymore. We are the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Who gave him, it says, for he had made him, he, that's God, made Jesus to be sin for us. God made Jesus to be sin for us. God made Jesus 
to be sin he was not a sinner he didn't sin in his life he did not sin i didn't call jesus a sinner i didn't say that he sinned made him considered him as sin offered him as the lamb of god on the cross that was the altar that god himself provided for the sin of the world because man had nothing to offer we had nothing to offer bring up before the throne i mean abraham with all his faith and goodness and uh, his integrity and his friendship towards god he said when god said bring your only son and offer him so when god when when abraham he offered his son he said if isaac died nobody is going to get saved isaac is only going to die and you are going to weep but he he said this is exactly what i'm going to do by sending my son jesus into this world through the birth of virgin mary she is no longer virgin she had many more children after that people still call her virgin mary sorry the bible says that she had many more children right so she was a virgin until jesus was born until jesus took took uh, conception so we would say through a virgin that jesus was born into this world that he might be the lamb of god just like isaac was the lamb or isaac was supposed to be offered on the cross jesus was offered on the cross the altar of god so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life for god has made jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin he had no idea about sin god is clean and pure he had no idea at all about sin he was the perfect lamb of god he is the last adam the bible talks about him being the last adam that was the first adam and here we find jesus being the last adam there was not going to be any more adams if jesus missed it we are all doomed to die that's how it would have been mankind had to had to be removed altogether but god made a covenant see god is so bound to his word that he cannot take back what he says he was bound to his word when he saw the misery of man he said in genesis chapter 3 and verse 5 he he pronounced something that was to happen he made sure that his words are going to be accomplished every book talks about the coming of jesus every book talks about jesus that's why we find you, every book in the old testament is important for us because we know for sure that that the book uh that it talks about jesus and his coming and and the reference of jesus mentioned in the book of uh, genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 we'll read that <clears throat> and i will put enmity between thee and the woman i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel that was a word that went forth out of the mouth of god over everything that took place in the life of adam and eve and all creation and jesus and god almighty pronounced these words he pronounced he is bound to his word god is bound to keep his word he doesn't say something and say oh, i'm sorry i made a mistake he is not man that he should lie numbers 23 and verse 19 says god is not a man that he should lie god is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent 
There's nothing for God to repent. He is not man. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Has he said something and will he not do it? And hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Or bring it to pass? Right? So this is what he brought to pass. That the seed of the woman, now the woman couldn't have a seed, it was the man. But God had to restrain the man and keep the man away from the woman until Jesus was born. Joseph, being a man of integrity, kept up to his word and said, okay, she's going to remain a virgin. And, and I believe that the, that, the, that the seed that she has conceived within her is of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to take up this child. I'm going to bring this child up. And that's how it happened. And, and we find uh, Genesis 3.15 being fulfilled through Jesus Christ being born and he bruised the head of the serpent as much as the serpent bruised the heel of Jesus. Put him up on the cross, nailed him to the cross, but while he was nailing him to the cross, God was able to destroy and bruise the head of the serpent and through death, the Bible says, through death in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number, Hebrews 2 and verse number 15, 14, where it says, through death, he destroyed the one who had the power of death. That is the devil. I mean, Satan thought the best is to put Jesus up on the cross, nailed him to the cross. You know, we call sometimes, we say, you nail the fellow. So the devil thought the best thing is to nail Jesus on the cross. Got him nailed on the cross, but while he was nailing, he was only getting bruised on his head and broke the power of destruction. And through the death of Jesus, he destroyed the one who had the power of death. So death has no dominion over your life. He, the power of death is broken. That is the devil. The power of death is the devil. And Jesus has already been resurrected. He's resurrected and he said in Revelations chapter, chapter 1 and verse 18, I believe, where he said, the keys of hell and death. Revelations chapter 1 and verse 18, I am he that liveth, I am he that liveth, and was dead. He died to gain access for us, for each and every one of us. I am I'm living, I, I am he that liveth, and I was dead, behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And he said, and have the keys of hell and death. So whatever the devil has, I got the keys. He has no right against you. And the blessing of Abraham, when Abraham was willing to offer his son on the, on the altar, the blessing, God looked upon him and blessed him and said, Abraham, you're representing mankind by bringing your son before me, before bringing your son before me. This is exactly what I'm going to do for you. In Genesis 22, in Genesis 22, we find that God promised Abraham something very important. In verse, I believe in... Uh, Genesis 22, let me just show you the scripture. Let me turn to that. 22 and verse number 17. And verse number 16 onwards. Verse number, okay, verse, uh, verse 15 onwards. 15 onwards. After God had stopped him from... Uh, using Isaac as the offering, and the second time he spoke to him with a word of blessing. 
He said, okay, I have seen your faithfulness. God said, now I know that you fear God. Now I know that you fear God. In, in verse number 12, he says that. In verse number 12, where he says, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him, for I now know that you fear God. See, fear of God has a lot of things to understand. Fear of God is not trembling and trembling in your boots or fearful and... Fear of God is to have understanding. Fear of God is the knowledge of God. Fear of God is how much you love him. It has a lot of things to do with the fear. Now I know that you fear. God said, I'm going to try, test you. God had to put a test in verse, number two, in verse number one. In the same book in verse number one, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham or he tested Abraham. And said, behold, Abraham said, here am I, say what you want to say. And then the second time he spoke to him and stopped him. He said, lay not thy hand upon, lay not thy hand upon thy son. Now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld thine only son. Not withheld thy only son, your most valuable and your only son. And then, he spoke to him again in verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham out of heaven the second time. The first time he said, don't lay your hands, hold it, hold it. Now I know that you love me and now that I know that you, you really understood what I said. This is what I'm going to do for you and your seed. That's why we are called the seed of Abraham. Jesus is called the seed of Abraham and we are in Christ Jesus, so we are the seed of Abraham. We are blessed, blessed. And the angel of the Lord called upon Abraham and said, out of heaven, the second time, and said, verse 16, by myself I have sown. I swear by myself, said the Lord, because thou hast, not, thou hast done this thing, that you have proved your faith with your works. You have proved your faith with your works. It's important. I can't say I have faith and not have any works in me. This was the works. I have faith, I have faith. That's good. But this is the works part of the faith of Abraham. Where he said, Lord, I'm going to bring my son upon the altar. Whatever you say goes, Lord. I know you have blessed me. You gave me this child at the, in the age of 100. I was 100 years old. And you gave me this son. It's a miracle boy. I know. It brought laughter into us. Isaac means laughter. But Lord, if you say I'm supposed to offer this laughter to you, I know it's, it's possible that you will raise this child. up Because he had this in his mind. He knew. Abraham, in his heart, he knew if God said it, I'm going to do it because I know God can raise this boy up. It's in, in Hebrews chapter 1, 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verse number 19. Accounting or considering that God was able to raise him up. Who? Isaac. He accounted in his mind. If God, you gave me this son in the age of 100, it's a miracle boy, brought laughter into our family. And Lord, if you say to offer him up, there are things that we... We find it difficult to offer to God when God says, give it to me, I have something more for you. There are times that we, God has a lot of things for us in store and he says, if you will only give up something that I tell you and you say, oh, I don't want to give up, Lord, I don't want to give up. God says, I have something more. But if you're a person of faith, you will say, and, and if you're somebody who fears God, you say, yes, Lord, I'll do what you tell me to do. Counting that, God was able to raise him up even from the dead. 
from whence he also received him in a figure. He, that's the man of faith. He receives him in a figure. You know, he didn't see, oh, Isaac offered to the altar. And he had never pictured, he had already figured it out. Isaac was already raised. I offer Isaac as a burnt offering unto the Lord. And I figure it out very well. I can see him coming out of the fire. I can see him being resurrected because I, I trust in him. I don't trust my flesh. I don't trust my feelings. I don't trust what people see. It's between me and God. I can imagine even Isaac had the faith of the father because he was strong enough to handle the father, I believe. The boy would have been about 17, 18 years old. He would have said, Father, you want to offer me up on the altar? Come, we'll play. Uh, what is that? Run and catch. What do, you, what do you call it? Hide and seek. Run and catch? Hide and seek? Whatever. Let's see whether you can catch me, boy, Father. Catch me. Catch me if you can. Catch me if you can. You want to tie me up? Put me up on the altar? Come, let's play a game up in the mountain. Foolish old man, don't try it on me. I'll put you up on the altar, the boy would have said. But he had the father's faith. He had the father's faith and he was willing to be offered. He knew that he was, because he had already had many practices. I mean, he has, he has been with the father many times. That's the reason he asked him, Father, we have the fire, we have the knife, we have the firewood, but where is the offering? Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham had to say, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide for himself, Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. So, I believe as Isaac also would have agreed with the father. Whatever my father does, he does the right thing. He doesn't do anything wrong. He offers me on the altar, that's how it's going to be. I'm not going to play with him because he's a man of faith. He's a prophet of God. I've seen him. I've seen him talking to God. I know who he is. Abraham had already figured it out as he had received him. He saw Isaac being resurrected. He saw Isaac being resurrected. Likewise, we find. So the blessing part comes in here. Verse number 16 again. Going back to Genesis. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him the second time and said, by myself I have sown, saying... For because thou hast, not, uh, thou hast done this thing has not, and hast not withheld thine only son, only son, that's all you had, Lord. That's all you had, son. I mean, that's all, Abraham, you had. I mean, this is a talk between God and Abraham. That's all you had and you gave it to me. This is what I'm going to do in return for you. See, when we bring our offerings also, we need to always remember God says, you haven't withheld some of the things that you were, you were holding on to. And when God says, give it, you gave it. You gave it. You said, Lord, I don't want to hold it back because I know giving always brings back a return. I know there are lots of Christians, they say like this. You see, I give it not with a selfish motive. I give it in such a way that I don't expect anything from God. That's not scriptural. Whether you like it or not, that's not scriptural. I'm not expecting anything from God. God is not a debtor to any man. God is not a debtor to any man. He gets pleasure in the prosperity of his saints or his servants, the Bible says in Psalm 35 and verse 20, 27. He gets pleasure. In fact, we are robbing his pleasure by not giving unto him. He gets pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. He takes pleasure. He says, my, I like to see my people getting blessed. Let them shout for joy and be glad. Psalm 20, 35, and 20, 35 and 27. Thy favor, my righteous cause, yea, let them say continually, the Lord be magnified, which take with that pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. See, when we give unto the Lord, 
he knows that there's going to be a blessing that's following us. Don't ever say, I just give and I, re- I don't expect anything. I've heard many Christians say, I don't expect anything from God. I'm just giving God. Why, well, you think God is a poor God? You think he's, he's somebody who really needs us? I mean, is he living on what we give him? No, he takes pleasure. He, sees, he, wants, he wants to see that that seed can be multiplied, blessed, so that you'll have over and above to give to every good work. You'll have over and above to give to give every good work after that. He wants you to prosper. That's the reason he wants you to give. He takes pleasure. So we are robbing his pleasure by holding back and saying, God, I don't want to give you what you really want me to give. There are times that God wants us to give certain things and it might be just like Isaac, our best something that has really brought laughter to us, something that we have really waited for and we have had it. And the next morning God says, now go, go and give it to this sister. Lord, this thing that you blessed me has brought me so much of laughter. Now I'm going to be so sad about releasing this from my hand. Lord, you have blessed me so much, Lord. And all of a sudden now you want me to release it and give it off. You're not giving it off. God is testing you to see whether you are faithful. And, and he surely is going to bless you with what, he has, what you have given back to him. Verse number 16. He say, verse number 16 we read. You have not withheld your only son. Verse number 17. That in blessing... I will bless you. What you gave to me is going to come back to you with a blessing. And do you know that the blessing of the Lord makes you rich and adds no sorrow? Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich and adds no sorrow. And the blessing, that's how that's how when God blesses, there is not going to be a sorrow. You would say, oh Lord, I gave my laughter away. Now I'm getting more laughters. I didn't really give it. I gave it to get more. That's the blessing of God. Right? The blessing in the, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply... And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens. You gave Isaac, I'm going to give you many more laughters, generation after generation after generation. The blessing of Abraham is still continuing. And we are, we are, in, we are the seed of Abraham. Abraham is still producing children. Every spiritual birth that takes place today, Abraham gets the credit. He said, that's my child. That's my seed. I'm just, that's my seed. He had not just given me one son, but he has given me sons like the stars of heaven. And we are all sons and daughters here, but he says, sons. Sons. He considers all of us as sons of God through Jesus Christ. In multiplying, I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and, the, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. I don't think we can ever count the stars, nor can we count the sand of the seashore. That's why I tell you, when you listen to the, to the mainstream media, you don't get this kind of a hearing. You don't hear that, that people are born into the kingdom of God in millions as the stars of the heavens and as the sand of the seashore. You don't hear that. You say so many were killed and so many were destroyed and she was robbed and this one was raped and and this took place and that took place and a tsunami and all. You won't hear this news because God says, I'm going to bless you with so much so. With what you gave. I'm going to bless you as the stars of the heavens. People are getting saved we may not be knowing. That's the reason we got to get so excited and start moving along 
with what God is doing in his kingdom. He's moving in such a manner, bringing people into the, into the fold. He's calling, he's bringing people in, in large numbers. We don't even realize people are getting saved one-on-one. Maybe in open-air crusades or maybe in churches, people who are in their hiding place and probably through media. I know there are lots of people who are watching even at midnight when everybody has gone to sleep and they're supposed not according to their faith, they're not supposed to listen to anything of Christ. But they wake up at midnight and slowly put their phones on and listen to these messages. And one such person called me and told me, he said, I come from this kind of a faith and I know we are, we are not loved to listen to any messages of Christ. But we don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. We just believe that he is, he never went to the cross. We don't believe that. But I, I do believe. I do believe. I travel around and I, he said, I go to every hotel and I find a Bible in the, in the room and I read that. And it has brought so much of conviction and I know Jesus is Lord. I know Jesus is Lord. People are watching. And they are getting saved. It's, it, it's, it's their heart. Although we don't see them in the open, there are many who are saved. There are many who are, there are many. Even Elijah couldn't recognize there were many. There were 7,000 people at that time who had not bowed down to Baal. Elijah thought, I'm the only prophet, I'm the only person. He said, no, there are 7,000 more who have never bowed down to the God of the worthlessness, unworthiness. So, and then the next blessing it says, your seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. Your seed shall possess, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He died on the cross and he destroyed the one who had the power of death. He, had, he destroyed the one who had the power of death. He took control. He, 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 he got him. He, he destroyed him. And he has given you, every believer, authority and power over all the power of the enemy. And you possess the gates of the enemy. You possess the gates of the enemy. The gates are the most important in the, in, the to- in the times they're talking about, I mean, even in present time, gates are important. That's why they have these fortresses and they have so much pre- precaution that they take place. Every country would take care of their gates, the entry points of the intruder. And God says, your seed shall possess the gates of the enemies, which means he has advanced us so forward to the enemy's gates and brought us that the enemy even can't come out. We are so strong, possessing his gates, the enemy. And thy seed shall possess the gates of... So we, we, we have come to realization by God's word that you don't live under the circumstances, you are over the circumstances. You don't, you don't carry all that care and worry in your mind. You just cast all your care upon the Lord. Your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his grace. Your, your, your enemies have no right over your life as long as you don't give him the right by your words and by your actions. Your enemy has no right over your life. The devil has no right over your life. The devil has no right over your life. Going back to the book of uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present from the present, not the future. Whichever generation you're living in, that's present. This generation, this generation, what, whatever that is evil in this generation, you have been delivered from. You might say, this 
present generation is the most wicked generation. Jesus said, the coming of the Son of Man would be as in the days of Noah. So the coming of Jesus would be as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. You mean to say those nations were not wicked? They were wicked. They were wicked. As much as the nations that we are living in, the world that we are living in. So consider yourself delivered from this present evil, this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. That's the will of God. That you are delivered. If your sins are forgiven, you've been delivered from the present evil world. So why fear about the evil world? People are preaching so much of fear. Be careful about that. Be careful about this. You don't know what's going to happen. You know what's going to enter into your body and all kinds of things. You're, you're going to be tracked wherever you go. You're, let me tell you one thing. People can track you wherever you are, but they cannot touch you because Jesus has prayed the prayer over your life. Jesus has prayed the prayer over your life. Jesus prayed to the Father and said, Lord, I pray that you take them not away from the world, but you keep them from the evil. Now here we are finding even more, even more clearly concerning this present world. People talk about, oh yeah, those days were good and God really protected them, but this, no, he's talking about this present evil world. According to the will of God, and our Father. That's the will of God. In your salvation, you have deliverance from the present world. Don't be afraid. Don't walk in fear. Don't walk in doubt. Don't walk in, in, a, in, a, in a manner that you don't even believe God's word. You kind of believe that the devil is more stronger. The devil is doing this and that and he is doing all. You know, you hear too much about the devil. If you read the book of Revelation, you don't hear about it. Actually, it's not talking about the devil. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The very first verse talks about this is the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, when God appeared to, to uh, John, he said, I'm going to reveal unto you of who I am. Put that scripture up, Revelation 1, verse 1 and 2. Revelation 1, verse 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, not about the devil. So when you read the book of the Revelation, don't you get hung up with all what the devil is doing. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, to start with, it tells us about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Get a revelation of Jesus Christ and who you are in Jesus Christ and what you can do in Jesus Christ and, and walking by faith. Get a revelation of Jesus Christ. So when you any, read, read any book in the Bible, you get a revelation of who Jesus is. You get a revelation of who Jesus is. 1 John 5 verse 18. 1 John... 5 and verse 18. We know, we know that whoso is born of God sinneth not. Who is born of God deliberately is not looking to rob a bank or to lie or cheat or to commit adultery. We know that whoso is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God or he that is born again keeps himself. How do I keep myself? How do I keep myself? By what I hear and what I say. By what I store and what I speak. That's how I keep myself. That's the only way you keep yourself. What you, what you hear. What you hear makes a difference in your life. What you hear makes a difference in your life and what comes out of you, it will totally make a change in your life. Proverbs 20 
And verse number 23 says, it says to, uh, how does it go? Let's see it. Proverbs 20, I'm sorry, Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart with all diligence. That's what you hear. Guard. Guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Because what gets into you comes out of your mouth. So if you want life to proceed out of your mouth and God wants you to enjoy life, then you've got to take care of what you hear. Take heed to what you hear. It's important of taking care of what you hear. It's important. Somebody might say, that's not too important for me. I, I mean, I'm just, I just casual, casually I keep hearing these things. I don't really mean to hear them. Well, that's how casually the devil also comes into us and say, yeah, are you really? That's nice. You're, you're, you're on a neutral ground then. And the devil said, that's a good place for me to just fill your heart with the wrong abundance so that you would just speak out out of the abundance of your heart. See, casual hearing can destroy your life. There are many people who are casually listening to a lot of things and you can see that they are weighed down there's no life in them. That's so, their spiritual quality is so poor. They can't make a decision, spiritual decision. Every decision they make, they make it in the flesh. Or they don't make any decisions towards the advancement of the kingdom of God because they are so poor in their, in their spiritual walk with the Lord. They're so poor in the spiritual walk with the Lord. So keep your heart with all diligence above all. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Death and life comes out from the power of the tongue. So life is supposed to be issuing out of your mouth. Because what gets into you comes out of your mouth. What gets into you, it really comes out of your mouth. So going back to the scriptures, in 1 John 5 and verse 18, Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, your spirit cannot sin. Let's get that once and for all settled. Your spirit, whoever is born of God, whosoever is born of God, uh, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. He does not sin. If your spirit sins, which means the Holy Spirit is sinning, and it's impossible for the Holy Spirit to sin. Because your spirit and the Holy Spirit, they are knit together. They are one. They are one. But he that is born of God keeps himself. That's his mind and his body. Your mind and your body. That the wicked one toucheth him not. Now the wicked one, we've been talking about no evil can touch you. We are talking about Lord, you protect us. But if you're going to be deliberately going against the will of God, doing things against the word of God, speaking nonsense, speaking things that we ought not to speak, it says, if we keep ourselves, how do we keep ourselves? Once again, our hearing gate, our eye gate, and also what comes out of our mouth. That's the only way we keep ourselves. That's the strongest way you want to keep yourself, you want to guard yourself, that the wicked one touch you not. He's so dirty when he touches you, he touches you with disease, sickness, poverty, every damnable thing he touches you with. So if you don't want the wicked one to touch you, then keep yourself. Keep yourself. We need to keep, I got to guard myself. What gets into me, what I hear, what I speak. I mean, even if you have not heard much, speak the word. Because the, 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 the principle behind is this. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. 
Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, where it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart. Number one, even if you can't believe in your heart, it's important that you confess first. Because what you keep confessing will eventually get into you where you will start believing with your heart. Many say, I don't want to say that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus because I'm sick. I just can't believe that. Okay? I can't believe that I'm healed because I'm sick. I am sick. You don't know I'm sicker than a dog. I'm sick. You don't understand. I'll tell you what I'm going through and you can list out everything that you're going through. And you're, you're listing out everything by your confession. Instead, I can tell you one thing. Start saying. The principle is this. If you confess with your mouth, the believing will start following you. And then eventually the believing is going to catch up with what you speak and then you're going to believe and speak. I'm trying to get it myself. You can't believe right now that you're healed by the stripes of... I can never say that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus because I know that I'm sick. You don't understand. I'm just boiling within myself. I'm sick. How, how do you expect me to believe? I can't believe. You know, let me take you another example. All this. Let me find it in the book of Matthew... Matthew, Matthew chapter number 9 and verse 20. And behold, a woman with a, which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years, came behind him, touched the hem of his garment and the next verse for she said within herself her saying was more than her believing it didn't say she believed and kept saying that if I go and touch the hem of his garment I'll be healed she kept saying within herself she kept saying within herself if I may touch, if I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. She kept saying, she kept saying, she was sick. She has spent all that she had. And she grew worse, the Bible says. But she kept saying, the saying overcame and then Jesus said unto her later in verse 22 the saying started before Jesus made this declaration about her but Jesus turned about and when he saw her he said unto her daughter be of good comfort your faith has made you whole. Her saying brought her to a position where she spontaneously, unconsciously started believing. And Jesus pronounced, okay, this is how I see you. That you, your faith has made you whole. Her saying brought faith into her spontaneously. So sometimes people say, I can't believe I'm healed. I'll call myself a liar if I ever say that. You're not calling a liar. Okay, didn't Jesus die for you? Sure, he died for you. You confessed and you believed 
and you got saved. There was no great massive faith inside of you that you really knew that Jesus rose again and the stone was rolled away and you didn't have all that faith but you confessed Jesus is Lord and then you started believing that God raised him from the dead. So it's your saying that will catch up with your believing and Jesus pronounced now I know, your heal, your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. Your faith. But the saying started before her faith. Her saying started before her faith. That's important. Her saying. And eventually when, you're, when her sayings caught up with faith, now she has faith to keep confessing, even if the enemy comes up against her she will say, I know, I know that I know that I know that I know I'm healed because Jesus pronounced that my faith has brought healing into my body. So I stand on my faith now and I pronounce that I'm healed. The symptoms would have come back to her. As usual, we find symptoms come back to us again and they start knocking at our door and saying, you're still sick. You mean to say you got healed? That was... Not the truth. I mean, you had some kind of a thing that happened there and you thought really, you really got healed and the devil starts bombarding your mind and saying, you are really not healed. You're still sick. And you got to attack those symptoms now by your faith because Jesus said, Jesus was able to stand as a judge there and say, yeah, I see you, faith. I see your faith. But it was her saying that brought her to Jesus. But her faith brought healing into her. Her saying overcame her faith. And now she is a woman of faith. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Look at the, look at the blind man who was seated by the side. When he said, who is going past by and what is all this? A commotion around and people said Jesus of Nazareth passed by Jesus of Nazareth passed by and uh, he said he said I've heard about Jesus of Nazareth about people but I know who he is he is the son of David so I'm going to call out I'm going to confess Jesus son of David have mercy on me his confessions started. He didn't have that faith, but his confession. Eventually, Jesus stood before him in Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, once again we see, confession went before he believed. The believing eventually caught up. Eventually, believing caught up. And they told him, verse number 37, and they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. That's how they knew him. Jesus was born in Nazareth, passed by. He cried, saying, he started saying something, Jesus, Savior, Deliverer, Son of David, you are the one who was supposed to come. Have mercy on me. <coughs> he confessed what he wanted. Deliverer, healer, who is Jesus? Jehovah Jireh, who is Jesus? Jehovah Rapha, Jesus, thou son of David. He started confessing. His sayings initially went before his believing. Have mercy on me. And they which went about, went before him, rebuked him. You know, people don't like when you confess the right thing. They would love. Oh, I'm just careful. I'm so worried. I'm so sick. What's wrong with you? I'm this, that, and the other. Oh, yeah. I was going to do the same thing last month, and I'm still having the same thing. I don't know when we are going to be redeemed of this. 
you can, you know, flesh goes along with flesh. Unbelief goes along with unbelief. Fearful people, they can just, but if you say, yeah, I had some symptoms, but I know that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Oh, 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 I want to keep myself away from you. Just like somebody who met me so many years ago, and he met me and he shook hands with me, and I, I met him, he was just passing by while I was just standing out there once. And then he said, hello, how are you? I mean, he's a child of God. He would have been uh, more of a Christian than me, according to what I thought, because I was quite young at that time. And uh, he, was, he had been in the Lord for, for more than me, more than the time that I had been from the, with the Lord. So he shook hands with me. He said, uh, how are you doing? I said, I'm well. I'm doing prosperously. I'm, 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 I'm doing well in life. And he took his hand off as if prosperity was going to flow into him and healing was going to flow into him. And he didn't want to catch that disease. He said, see you, bye. I said, why? We just started a conversation. I only said that I'm prosperous and I'm doing well. You asked me how you are. The only reason... He would have expected me to say, I'm living under the circumstances, the days are bad, you see. Oh, he would have kept his, shaking his hands, hands for a while with me and then he would have stood with me for a while. But he took his hands off. My, this guy, he believes in prosperity and healing, so I'm going to take my hands off because that's contaminating. I don't want to get contaminated. Saying goes before your believing. Right, so he, and people rebuked him for his sayings. You blind beggar, who do you think you are? You stay where you are and keep begging. Rebuked him for his sayings. That he should hold his peace. Shut up, don't say Jesus. They themselves answered and said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. What are you doing? I'm just going with the crowd. See, there are lots of people who go with the crowd, but there are only few people who go deliberately. We go with the crowd following Jesus, but there are some people who are deliberate. The woman with the issue of blood was deliberate. When, when, uh, when Jesus turned around and said, somebody touched me because virtue has gone out of me, and the disciples said, Lord, there are people, all thousands of people. I mean, history even says that, you know, at least... 20 to 30,000 people are following him all the time. All the time. Just to see the miracles that he was doing. But we find here, they said, everybody is touching you, but Jesus said, no, there's somebody who touched me. And the woman owned up and said, yes, I am the woman. Your, wo your faith has made you whole. So we find here the same, the, the same situation. He cried out and the people said, hold your peace. You know, you will have people who come around you and say, you look very sick today. And when you say, no, I believe that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, don't say that, that's a lie. I can see it from your eyes, your eyes are red. You're sick. Can I touch you? Oh, you're warm. My God, terrible. I mean, you use the word, my God, like a curse word there. You don't say, God, I thank you for healing her. You say, oh, my God. That's how people are. Don't call yourself healed when you're sick. But this man, he called out Jesus, who is the healer. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He cried so much more. I like that. I like this guy's deliberation. I mean, people want to stop him, but he cried out the more. Just be a daring character like that and see how quick you will have results coming into your life. Be a daring character. Don't stop just because somebody says, don't say, don't cry out to Jesus. Don't say that Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. Don't say, now this man was genuine in his declarations. He's so genuine in his declarations that Jesus saw his declarations and, and he, Jesus pronounced it like this. And uh, verse number 40, and Jesus stood... 
I always say this, Jesus was glued to the ground. He couldn't move. Jesus was glued. Every time you call out in faith, or your declarations are very positively scriptural, you always remember that Jesus will stand strong on your behalf. And he commanded, it was a command. He he didn't consult disciples. What do you think, disciples? Do you think I should bring this man up? He commanded. He didn't go by the words of the disciples, and some of the disciples would have said, no, don't get him down. We're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to touch him and heal him, and there's going to be a testimony and all that. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Make it fast. We're hungry. We want to go and sit somewhere and eat. That's what they've always had this in their mind. Andrew and Jesus was preaching to the group of 5,000 plus people and, and the disciples came and said, we are hungry, we, is there anything to eat? Send the people away. I mean, they didn't say it that way. They said, this is a desert place. But it was their hunger that was speaking. Send them away. Send them away. So Jesus didn't consult his board of directors. Peter, he commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was When he was come near, he asked him, the next verse, saying, what wilt thou that I shall do for thee? He said, Lord. He accepted him as Lord, not just Jesus of Nazareth. He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. That I may receive my sight. And the next verse, Jesus said unto you, receive your sight. But let me tell you one thing. Your words, your faith-filled words have caught up with your faith and your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. His words went before his believing. So that's the reason I'm encouraging you and everyone, don't you ever stop speaking God's word even if you don't believe. Because believing is going to catch up eventually. Your words. Your words are very powerful. How forcible are right words, the Bible says in Job. What does it say? Uh, In Job 6, I believe, or 23. How forcible are right words? How forcible are right words? Put that scripture up. Your words are very important. I can't say anything because if I say it's a lie, it's not a lie. He said, Jesus, how forcible are right words. Job 6 verse 25, is that right? Yeah. How forcible, how strong are right words. Speak the right words. I preached a message last Sunday at another church in the opening. I said, it's not doing the good thing that is important. It is doing the right thing that's important. People do a lot of good things. People do a lot of good things, but it is the right thing. In uh, Second Chronicles chapter 29, I spoke from there, verse number 2, where it says, when uh, King Hezekiah, he came into his throne when he was very young. What did he do? He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David, his father, had done. He did that which was right. You know, many Christians are doing some good things in their life, but they're not doing the right thing. Right? A right thing is very important. Doing the right thing is more important than doing a good thing. People do a lot of good things. Oh, let me just do some good thing. Sometimes they do good things to receive the favor of people or the applaud of the people or the praises of people, but when you do the right thing, you'll have a lot of opposition. This man did the right thing, and he had opposition. He said, Jesus, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And that made the change. So let's look to the Lord this day and thank him for the words of wisdom and understanding his goodness that he protects you from this world. And how does he guard you from this world? For what you hear and what you speak out with your mouth. He keeps you. He guards you. He protects you. 
So don't you be feeling guilty within you. Oh my, I cannot say when my symptoms are very strong. I'm just, I feel like crying out my symptoms. I feel like crying out my symptoms. When Jesus hung on the cross, his symptoms never allowed him to say, Father, forgive them for they know, what, they know not what they do. His symptom cried out and said, his symptom that I said, it's hurting, I'm dying. It's miserable being up on the cross. But he confessed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His confession brought him up from the grave. His confession brought him up from the grave. Or you might say, how would you prove that? By revelation. If you would have said, Lord, send down your fire. I just can't bear myself, Lord. That would have been the end of Jesus. That would have been the end of mankind. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If his flesh spoke out, that's exactly what would have happened. But he spoke out in faith. And that's how today you and I are born into the kingdom of God. And thank God for his grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of life and your words of peace. And thank you, Father, for keeping us strong and healthy to serve you all the days of your life, each and every one of us who are here right now and those who are viewing and those who would view later. I pray, Lord, for your grace upon their lives. You said in your word that you protect us and guard us from all harm and danger. You said by nothing shall by any means hurt you. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that the eyes of their understanding be opened and the ears of their hearing, that they will say, yes, I know that I know, that I know, that I know that I'm healed. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, she kept saying. And her believing caught up with her saying. And the man who was a blind beggar, his believing caught up with his words. And that's how you make us believers. It's our saying first. And then our believing follows. Thank you, Lord. And eventually, we know that we would turn out to be believing, confessing the right thing. Father, we thank you for your grace. And as we partake in this covenant meal, we remember what you have done for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.
you, Lord Jesus, for the word. Thank you, Lord, for your life-giving word. Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of the living God. I thank you, Father, as we partake in this covenant meal. Your words remain the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. You died for us and you rose again, O oh God. You went through death and hell, and through which you were resurrected. And you live inside of us, and we are so thankful to you, Lord. We're no longer, Lord Jesus, sinners, unworthy, unprofitable, but we are forgiven saints of God. Lord, we thank you that you didn't curse, hanging up on the cross, starting with the high priest, who was the sole reason to offer your body as a sacrifice. It was the order of the high priest that offered the body of Jesus on the cross. And Father, you, and Jesus, you confess the right thing on the cross. Father, forgive the high priest and the rest of them who know not what they do. They were only offering the final lamb, the final offering that was for the redemption of mankind. Lord, we are so thankful to you, Lord, for the beautiful creation and the perfectly ordained plan of God to redeem man from every curse. We are so thankful to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us so much so that you gave yourself. Oh, we thank you and we thank you for your death that has brought resurrection into us. To live a resurrected life. To have within us the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That we would be able to live fearless. Thank you, Father, for the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Be redeemed from every curse. You're free from the curse of sickness, disease, and poverty. Be released from every bondage right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive your healing by saying, Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Just thank him by re receiving. Maybe you feel a bit better, but by thanking you receive wholeness. Just like the leper who came back to Jesus. All ten were cleansed, but the one who came to Jesus out of the ten was made whole because he started thanking the Lord. Start thanking the Lord and receive wholeness into your body. Receive. He doesn't want to take a few symptoms off. He's not going to cut off a few uh, stems and the, and, and, and the leaves. But he wants to uproot that very sickness out of you. Maybe it's a terminal illness in your body. He wants to uproot that terminal illness altogether. And you do it by faith. And you come before the Lord and say, Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Don't say, oh, I'm just a bit better. I feel a bit okay. I don't know. Wonder if it comes back to me again. No, go for the full. Amen. I'm not a bit healed. I come to him by thanksgiving and receive wholeness. Wholeness. The nine, they went back, cleansed. But the last one who came to Jesus, he was made whole. And there again we see his confession went before Jesus pronouncing, your faith has made you whole. Thank you, Jesus. Start thanking the Lord by faith. The word confession and thanksgiving is the same Greek word. Same word. Thank you, Jesus. And also confessing his promises is the same word that is used for the word confession in the New Testament. Thank you, Jesus. The fruit of our lips giving thanks unto the Lord. Continually, that's the same word that is used for the word confession. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I believe I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I receive my healing. I receive. It's already in me. I'm not going to receive it someday. I've already received it. And I thank God for wholeness. Thank you, Lord. Let's praise him and honor him and come before him, bringing our tithes and our offerings. And as you bring into the soil of the kingdom of God, you bring into the storehouse, the Bible says, as you come into the storehouse, that there might be meat in his house. The people might have revelation knowledge as they receive the good. As, as, you, as, as, as you bring in, it's, been, it's your sowing into the kingdom of God and God is going to honor you by returning back to you. That's his grace. Let's honor him and praise him. of sin for your blood has set me free I'm redeemed from the curse of sickness for your blood has set me free I'm redeemed from the curse of poverty for your blood has set me free Father, we thank and praise you for your grace and your love and your favor towards us. We thank you, Lord, for your protection over all harm and danger in our lives. We thank you for your covering. We thank you for the blood that you've given us. We thank you for the word that you've given us. We thank you for the promises that you have for us. We thank you for the name that is above every other name that is given unto us, O God. And we honor you this day and we praise you and we thank you, Father, even as each and every one of them, those who are viewing and those who are also here right now, Father, even as they have honored you with their tithes and their offerings of God, that you will honor them and you will, Lord, touch their lives and bring joy and happiness into their lives. Father, you said give and it should be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Father, we also know, Lord, even as Abraham brought Isaac, his laughter, and Lord, he honored him, honored God, Father, by giving, and Lord, the blessing that he received was enormous, O oh God. That was greater, and, and the blessing still keeps flowing, O oh Father. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your blessing would be a generational blessing into the lives of people, O oh God, as they give, as parents are tithers, or as grandparents and great-grandparents are tithers, oh, and honors, honoring you, Father. Let, Lord, the blessing would continue for generations thereafter. 
Thank you, Father, for all the good that you do for each and every person. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.